Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln and in this video I wanted to actually have a look at tidally locked planets and whether they are actually habitable. Even if they exist in the habitable zone, are they actually habitable? Well, first let's have a look at what we've actually discovered so far. So this is from the Exoplanet Archive which you can use to generate plots of all the discovered exoplanets to date. So actually, if you have a look now, it might look slightly different to what I've put here because there'll be new planets added. However, if you look at that, there are a collection of planets that have very, very small orbital periods, which means they're very close to their star. So these are likely going to be tidally locked. And actually, if you have a look, there's not that many of them actually really close to their star. But if you have a look at the bottom section of that, there are some that are rocky terrestrial planets. So these are all planets that are very close to their star, but they've also got radiuses which are similar or in and around that of Earth. So these are likely going to be rocky terrestrial planets. They're the ones we're interested in for tidal locking for this video. Now, most major moons are tidally locked. So when I say major moon, I mean fairly sizable in comparison to the planet so our moon is actually quite large compared to the planet but then you've got things like triton around neptune europa and enceladus these are all going to be tidally locked and that means that the same face always faces towards us and what does that actually mean well it means that their rotation period so as they rotate on their axis it takes the exact same time for it to do one orbital period to so go around the object. So if we're talking about a planet here, if it's tidally locked, then it will rotate once as it goes all the way around the star and back again. So that the rotation period and orbital period match exactly. So we will only see one face if we were looking from the point of view of the star. Now, a better example is probably the moon, actually. If we were to look at the moon, look up in the sky, we'll always see the same face facing towards us. And actually, that's on the, the right hand side here. Regardless of the actual phase itself, that same face will always be facing towards us. We're unable to see the far side of the moon or the dark side. It's not necessarily dark, but we can't see the, the other side of the moon from the Earth because it's tidally locked. And it just rotates once all the way around as it goes around. So we never get to see that far side. Now, as it's orbiting around and it's rotating, it actually gets distorted. So this is before it actually becomes tidally locked, why it becomes tidally locked. It rotates and you get a tide on the object. And if they're closer together, then you get this fairly strong tidal force, which will stretch the object. So think about the tides we have on Earth from the moon. We get them in the oceans. But if the, the tides are strong, fairly significant, it will distort the entire object, including the actual rocks and stuff. So it actually is pulled and stretched as it spins. Those tides are going to be much stronger if it's closer to the star or the planet. The further out they are, then the tides become weaker and we weaker. So actually it's more enhanced when the objects are closer to the, the much larger object creating the tide. Now, the material that the object is made of is going to resist being deformed. It doesn't want to be deformed, so it, it will resist it. If you could imagine trying to deform a planet made of rock, that's going to be quite hard to do. And what happens there is that the rotational energy, so it acts like a, almost like a, a friction on its rotation, it slows it down, but that rotational energy is then dissipated as heat. So it will internally heat up the other object, the smaller object, to the point where it actually becomes tidally locked. So it will slow it down and then it will become tidally locked. But in the process, it actually will heat it up. And actually, Jupiter's moon Io is a good example of that, really. So tidal friction on the rotation can drive volcanic activity. And you can see here you've got some nice kind of volcanoes there. So a tidally locked planet is likely going to have an excess of internal heat compared to a comparable planet that hasn't gone through that process. So, again, you might want to think about you know, volcanic activity on a tidally locked planet as well. Now off to the habitable zone. So the habitable zone is a distance from a star where it's you get just the right amount of energy from it or radiation from the star where you can have liquid water on its surface. So we're in the habitable zone. We typically want to look for planets there because 
we think that's the best place to look for life elsewhere. We don't really want to look too close because it'll be too hot. And we don't want to look too far away because it'll be too cold if we're looking for a planet in the Howdwell zone. So we're looking in this green region here where a planet could have liquid water on its surface. Now, the Habdal zone does change with star. So the, the blue sort of band here is the Habdal zone. And on the y-axis, you've got a change in size of the star, basically. So the, the different masses of star. The sun is at the top, along with some planets in the solar system. And you can see Earth's kind of in the middle or thereabouts in the Habdal zone. You've got Mars and Venus as well. But as you go down, that habitable zone gets closer to the star because it gets smaller. The star just doesn't emit it, the same kind of radiation. It emits much less. So you actually need to be much closer to the star. So here you've got a red dwarf star and you've got four planets there which are much closer to the star. But there are two planets that are kind of straddling the habitable zone despite being much closer to their star than our planets in the solar system. Now, the interesting thing here is that planets around red dwarf stars need to be much, much closer to their star to be habitable. So you need to put them really close up to the red dwarf for it to get the right amount of energy to have liquid water on its surface. Now, that then coincides with the planet also likely being tidally locked. Because they're so close to their star, those tidal forces are going to be much stronger. So it's likely that these planets are going to be tidally locked or if they're not tidally locked, they will be in the process of becoming tidally locked because they're so close. And another interesting thing is that red dwarf stars are one of the most common types of star in our galaxy, likely in the universe as well. So when we're looking for habitable planets, we're going to find quite a lot around red dwarf stars, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know, but we are going to find a lot of planets around red dwarf stars that are likely going to be habitable compared to sun-like stars anyway. And an example is Trappist-1. So there are actually seven planets here that are in and around the habitable zone. And they are much, much closer, as you can see, compared to the inner solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, they are really close to the star, much, much closer. To be, and that still potentially habitable and if you overlay our solar system with trappist-1 and just compare the amount of energy that's reaching them then they're almost comparable energy wise to what we have mercury's kind of a bit too close but you've got quite a few planets there that are similar sort of size terrestrial size but they're in and around the habitable zone but are they actually habitable so the day side is likely going to be too hot and the night side is going to be too cold because it's going to be tidally locked, which we suspect Trappist-1 is likely going to be. We expect there to be quite a temperature difference across the planet. So the face facing towards the star, very hot, and the side facing away the night side is always going to be too cold. However, the Terminator could be just the right temperature. And this is the location that separates the day and night side. So there could be a band between day and night where you might get the right temperature. And the Terminator is the line that separates the day and night side. So the example here is the moon. And if you were to look at it when it's kind of like half illuminated, the line down there is going to be your Terminator. And this is the location on a tidally locked planet where you might get the right temperature to be habitable and it's also going to be in permanent twilight so if you were there on that planet the sun or the star would appear to be always just about setting or just about rising so it's going to be permanent twilight on this planet at this particular location however it has the potential to be habitable the side too close to the star too hot the other side night side too cold but just in the middle has the potential to be the right temperature so the whole planet might not be habitable, but there could be a band there that might be. However, there is a bit of a problem with energy transport. So assuming these planets have an atmosphere, then what happens is some of the energy from the hot side can get transported to the cold side. 
So what happens is the hot air or the air is heated on the day side by the permanent illumination from the star. That's going to rise and circulate around to the cold side. And what that does is it can then change your temperature gradient and it transports heat around and it can give a more equal temperature over the planet despite the planet still having a day and night side permanently. So it has two effects essentially. It's going to create some wind and that would be determined by the temperature gradient. So if you've got a large temperature gradient, so very hot on one side, very cold, then you have the potential to generate some reasonably strong winds there as you get as you circulate the air or the atmosphere around. It's also going to transport heat to the cold side. And this then in turn is going to reduce your temperature gradient. So those two things are kind of important to consider really. Now interestingly, if you've got an ocean world, so a planet which is dominated by oceans, this effect is enhanced. And on the on the day side, you're going to get kind of water vapor, quite a significant amount of water vapor. And that actually is able to transport heat from the day side to the night side more efficiently. And that then creates a lower temperature gradient. What does that actually do then? Well, if you're spreading out the, the temperature over the planet more, it means that that terminator is likely going to get too hot now. So it's likely not going to be habitable. So if you've got a, an ocean world and it's tightly locked, you might not be able to be or might not have a habitable location anywhere on the planet. The best situation really is to have a desert world. It's going to be more likely to be habitable because you've got a stronger or a more significant temperature gradient. And then in the middle between the two, you have a band which could be the right temperature. But if you've got too much water vapor there, then that reduces down and you get a more even distribution of temperature across the planet. So we might want to look for desert worlds around red dwarf stars, maybe. Might be the best place, as opposed to an ocean world. Now, if the planet is on an elliptical orbit, so it could be tidally locked, but it could still be on an elliptical orbit. So it gets closer to the star than further away during one orbit. It can still have some tidal heating because it, as it gets closest, it will be stretched by the tide. And then as it moves further away, it actually relaxes back. So the, the tides are going to be weakest further away from the star. And that will then introduce some heat into the planet as well. So it gets tidally heated from its elliptical orbit as well as from the tidal locking. And what that actually does is the orbital energy that's lost will be dissipated as heat because the planet doesn't, well, it's going to resist being deformed. So again, that's a resistance and it loses orbital energy, which makes it more circular and it will kind of get a bit closer to the star as well. And that then manifests as heat inside the planet. So you lose the orbital energy and it gets hotter internally, essentially. And that will then drive volcanic activity, potentially. So tidally locked planets are going to have an excess of heat that a normal terrestrial planet that hasn't been tidally locked or any kind of tidal evolution in its orbit would have. So you could potentially have more volcanic activity. And that might be worth thinking about if you're thinking about habitability on one of these tidally locked planets. So thank you for watching. And if you enjoy, then do check out some of the other videos.